I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening to the second night of our gospel meeting with Brother Ron Halbrook. The subject matter tonight will be the moral glory of Christ. There are all sorts of very important and interesting meetings and activities that gather people every day. Some are political in nature, some are educational activities, some are medical groups, uh, of course governmental activities, and much of this centers around trying to find good leaders in different activities that affect our lives. Tonight, I hardly feel adequate to talk about the subject that we have before us. We're going to be talking about the moral glory of Jesus. And we thank you and welcome you for coming tonight. Thank this church for making plans to have these meetings and to proclaim the gospel this week. And Donna and I consider it a privilege to be with you. I want to thank Sister Carr for her wonderful meal tonight. Good to have Stan and Carl. They've been an encouragement to us going way back in the years. And it's encouraging to be with them again. And those that are visitors, we welcome you especially. And as John said, please keep in mind that the floor will be open for any questions that you might have about our study tonight. Let's turn our attention to the moral glory of Jesus. Beginning in Hebrews chapter 7, in verses 26 to 28, Paul is discussing in the context that Jesus Christ is our high priest, unlike any high priest of the Old Testament time. This high priest is the sinless Savior, and he is the perfect high priest. So Hebrews 7, 26. <clears throat> For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins, and then for the peoples. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. The Old Testament high priests were just humans, and they sinned too. But the word of the oath, God's oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. They had a new high priest every few years. We have an eternal high priest. But the most significant difference is this. Our high priest is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And for that reason, he could come and offer the one perfect sacrifice to take away our sins. I want us to think about the moral glory of Jesus Christ. His character. What did he do while he was here that had such an impact on the world? The influence of Jesus reflects the perfections that are so unique in his moral character. There's a religious historian named Philip Schaff that wrote an eight-volume history of the church beginning in the Bible times coming up to fairly modern times. And every volume is thicker than an encyclopedia or a dictionary. This man had an amazing grasp of history, not only religious history, but secular history. In his book, The Person of Christ, I want to share some statements that he made about the moral glory of Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander, Caesar, Mohammed, and Napoleon. Now in the rest of the quotation, he's going to point out some things that ordinarily are necessary to make men great leaders, such as science and learning, eloquence, or writing. All right, now watch what he said. Without science and learning, he shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and schools combined. Without the eloquence of schools, he spoke words of life such as never were spoken before or since, and produced effects which lie beyond the reach of any orator or poet. Without writing a single line, 
he has set more pens in motion and furnished more themes for sermons, orations, discussions, and learned volumes, works of art, and sweet songs of praise than the whole army of great men of ancient and modern times. There never was in this world a life so unpretending, modest, and lowly in its outward form and condition, and yet producing such extraordinary effects upon all ages, nations, and classes of men. Now, as you reflect on that, it is an astonishing statement of the influence and the impact this single man had over the course of the centuries. But how about if we would make it personal? Who has more impact, who has had more influence in your life, your life, than anyone else that ever lived? And it's this same man. That influence reaches us all. I want to think about the moral glory of Jesus. What is there about this man? His moral glory shines like a beacon through all of history, and that beacon shines right into our hearts as well. I'm going to think about the moral perfection of Jesus when he was tempted. I want to study just a few moments the moral glory of Christ meticulously examined. And then last, the moral glory of his teaching. Never a man lived like this man. Think about the moral perfection of Christ when he was tempted. Can we not all relate to temptation? We've all experienced that. And Christ understands our struggles. The Bible teaches that he was sinless. We read about that. But yet he is sympathetic to our struggle with temptation because he also tasted it personally. You will remember Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we have a high priest which cannot be touched, we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He understands it perfectly. But was in all points tempted like as we are. And what is the difference? Yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He is a sympathetic high priest because he understands the power and the force of temptation. And yet he rose above it in a way that we do not. That's his moral glory. And I'll just examine one passage on this. It's one that you're familiar with. Let's turn to Matthew 4. And let's remember when he withstood the masterful <coughs> of Satan who was so determined to tempt Jesus in a manner that he would fall. The tempter came and the tempter left. He left in defeat, defeated by the Son of God and the power of the Word of God. You remember that Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And so the first approach was Satan, the first approach of Satan, was through the lust of the flesh. Jesus would have been very hungry. And so Satan will tempt him to use his great power for a selfish purpose. So beginning in verse 3. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, before we finish the reading, let's ask ourselves, could Jesus have turned rocks into bread? Why, sure he could. He multiplied, multiplied a few fish and loaves to feed thousands of people. But he could do this. Now, can you see the tempting factor of it would have been the extreme hunger after 40 days and nights of fasting? But he answered and said, it is written, Man shall not bear by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Is God the one that told Jesus to turn stones to bread? 
No, it wasn't God, it was Satan, wasn't it? And Jesus said, I will not do it in spite of my hunger at the prompting of Satan. I will obey the word of my Father, but not the promptings of Satan. He defeated Satan on that score. Now Satan comes at him again. This time using the avenue of pride. He will tempt Jesus to make a vain display out of his power, almost like a circus event, just to show he can do something. Verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, pass thyself down, for it is written, Satan can quote scripture, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Now pause and think of that. It's from the Psalms, and the scripture is true. What God is promising, that as his people go through horrific trials, God has many means by which to deliver us, even he can use angels. And so if Jesus were falling off the pinnacle of the temple, could God rescue Jesus? And the answer is he could. But now on this occasion, to what purpose would such a miracle be? The miracles are designed to convince people of the truth of the message. Is Satan going to believe Christ if Jesus will jump and God will deliver him? Well, the answer is no. He was a rebel to his core. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now how does that statement relate to the psalm that was quoted? That God can deliver us. It would be like one of us today, jumping in front of a train and asking God to deliver us. There's no reason for Jesus to be falling off the pinnacle of the temple except just to show that he can do a trick. Vain pride. Because he could have no purpose to convert Satan. All right, Satan is defeated. He comes back again. This time he will use the lust of the eyes. The temptation is that Jesus can receive a kingdom without suffering. From the earliest days of the training that Jesus gave his disciples, he explained to them that I will suffer among men and then I will die by crucifixion and then I will have my kingdom. Now they did not fully grasp all of that, but he repeated that many times. So Jesus knew clearly the path to his kingdom is the path of suffering that ends with a bloody, horrific death. Satan is going to offer an easy alternative to that. Here's how he did it. The devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Reminds me over in East Tennessee on a clear day, you can see about four states. All right, we're up on a high mountain. Look this direction and that direction and there, you'll see a kingdom in every direction. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou fall down, will fall down and worship me. You won't have to suffer. There's no cross. It's easy to have a kingdom. Just bow down and worship me. Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So even if the alternative takes me down the road of suffering and death, I will not <coughs> worship Satan. Satan was defeated on all fronts. You and I have faced the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, and we have fallen. In this account, we see the moral glory of Jesus. He did not fall into the devil's trap. Number two, his moral glory was meticulously examined. 
as we begin on this, let me give a comparison. Could I imagine if someone was so obsessed with disliking me that they would follow me around to watch every move I make and plant devices in my home to hear every word I say and do their best to find anything wrong, any mistake that I would commit. Now that would be a very difficult trial. But Jesus was meticulously examined both by friends and enemies. And his moral strength was so great no one ever found a single sin in his life. I could not endure that examination. Could you? Think about the battles he faced with religious leaders who were determined, I mean utterly determined to destroy him. And they did send spies to watch him and to try to catch him in any misstatement. And they put trick questions to him for the same reason. In one of those debates in John 8, remember when he said, if you believe not I am he, you will die in your sin? And then he also said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And they were highly offended at such teaching. You mean to say we have to believe in you or we go to hell? You mean to say that we're slaves of sin and you're going to make us free? This was a very pointed and heated debate. And they wanted desperately to find some wrong in Jesus. And we'll pick this up at John 8, 41. And we'll see they found no evidence of sin in him as much as they wanted to. Jesus, in continuing the debate, said this in verse 41. You do the deeds of your father. Then, say they, then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. That's a way of saying, we know where we came from. We know who we serve. And God is our Father. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but He sent me. So if God is your Father, why do you not believe my teaching? I came from God the Father in heaven. All right, verse 43. And why do you not understand my speech? Why is it that you cannot connect the dots and get the point? Even because you cannot hear my word. He doesn't mean their eardrums were full of wax. He means it's impossible with the state of your heart for you to understand what I'm teaching. And here's why. He put his finger right on it. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. And if you think that Jesus is being overly sharp, just go to the next part. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Jesus is literally reading their hearts. Satan was the origin of the first murder when Cain killed his brother. And Jesus knows they are already plotting his murder right at this time. So I know your heart, and I know who you follow. You have murder in your heart right now. How can you possibly understand my teaching? When he, that is Satan, speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And you people are following those lies. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Now, here they are trying their best to find any wrong, any error, any mistake, any sin, and Jesus just opens himself to them. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Could I stand before all the people that have known me through the years and say, I dare you to find one sin or mistake in my life. But I'd hang my head because several hands would go up. Can you realize Jesus stood before this audience, his enemies, and said, I'm an open book, 
point out any sin I've ever done. And they were as silent and motionless as a tomb. Jesus concluded, He that is of God heareth God's words. You therefore hear them not because you are not of God. The moral glory of Jesus is seen when his enemies examined him meticulously and could not find even one sin, one mistake, one error. So how did they manage to crucify him? Before a court of law, they used perjury and not sin to condemn him. Let's go back to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, and you will recall the trial of Jesus before the Jewish authorities. Matthew 26, 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Wow. That's a powerful statement. They already knew they could not find a true witness against him, so they're literally searching for false witnesses. Now, under Jewish law, they have to have two or three that agree. And I want you to look at how incompetent these liars were. Verse 60, But found none, though they many false witnesses came, yet found they none. Meaning, they were so incompetent, they couldn't get two of them to tell the same lie. And finally, at last, came two false witnesses and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Did Jesus say that? In John 2, Jesus said to the unbelieving Jews, you will destroy, not I will destroy, you will destroy the temple of God and I will build it in three days. Referring to his body. Referring to the crucifixion. So the two witnesses now twisted his word just enough so they can give a lie that amounts to blasphemy and have Jesus put to death. So the point I'm making again is this. Reviewing his whole lifetime, they cannot find a single thing to accuse him of that's valid. And so they have to shop for liars to find something against him. The moral glory of Jesus shines forth. Not a single skeleton in his closet. Now if you want to ask me, Brother Halbrook, do you have any skeleton in your closet? I'm just going to tell you the truth right now. Yes, I have seen it. That's why I'm here, actually. Knowing that I stand condemned in the court of heaven, I throw myself on the grace of God and ask His forgiveness through Christ. That's why I'm here. Now how about you? Is anybody here that could say there are no skeletons in my closet? I don't think any one of us would dare say such a thing. The moral glory of Jesus shines forth. All right, look at it from another angle. I had mentioned if somebody was obsessed with not liking me, but let's, what about the people that do like me? What about my friends? What about my parents, my brothers and my sisters? Uh, people that have known me through the years in an intimate way. Well now, the Bible shows that we can read the assessments of the friends and associates of Jesus. The people closest to him, not his enemies. Now Judas was very close to him. He later turned against him. But in Matthew 27, 3 and 4, after Judas betrayed Jesus, he said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. I was close to this man, and I can tell you, he was never guilty of any wrong, and I betrayed him. Close associates said he's innocent. Now in John 19, 25 to 27, when Jesus was crucified, remember, what did the disciples do? They fled for their lives. But you remember there were a handful of women standing at the cross, including his mother. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. You know why his mother did not abandon him at the cross? She knew him intimately from his birth through his whole life. 
and she knew he was not a criminal. She was not ashamed of him for one moment. Who knew him better than she did? Later, in Acts 3 and 14, when Peter was preaching to some of the unbelieving Jews, and he spoke for the apostles in making this statement, Ye, you people that cried out, crucified him, ye denied the Holy One and the just. Peter, on behalf of the apostles, is saying, the man you denied, the man you crucified, is holy and just. Just is equivalent to saying innocent. You killed an innocent man. And the point I'm making is, they were well qualified to make a statement like that because they were with him so intimately for three years, day and night. And they knew he was just and he was holy. I could, not I could not withstand the meticulous examination that Jesus had because you will find weakness and wrong in my life's history. But no man ever found even one sin in the life of Jesus. That's the moral glory of Jesus. Think with me a few minutes then about the moral glory of his teaching. What greater sermon could we read than the Sermon on the Mount? Did you know even atheists have written books in which they asserted that the greatest moral and ethical sermon of history is the Sermon on the Mount? And truly it is a beacon light. And it's not deep with philosophy and theology. It's powerful for its simplicity. Here is a verse the children learn in their classes and learn at home. Matthew 7, 12. Therefore all things, whatsoever you would, that man should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Jesus summarized his sermon and all the ethical teaching of the Old Testament in such a simple, powerful, and beautiful way. Treat other people the way you would like to be treated. Now, there's something that is sometimes called the iron rule. This is the rule that dictators commonly use. Might makes right. Do to other people before they can do it to you. The iron fist. The moral glory of Jesus is seen in the golden rule, not the iron fist. There's another rule that was called the brass rule. Do to others as they do to you. So strike back and retaliate. If somebody hurts you or embarrasses you, you make them pay for it. That's not what Jesus said either, is it? Do to others, even your enemies, as you would like them to do to you. All right, there's another rule that's been called the silver rule. Do no harm. Do not do to others what you do not want them to do to you. Now, that's a fairly good rule, but it's a passive rule. I can step back from every human being and never do anything. So I did not do to them, or I'm doing to them what I want them to not do to me. I, I'm not going to harm them, and other than that, I don't do anything to them. Again, the golden rule. Far outshines that. It's active. Do to others, even your enemies, even those that hurt you, even those that embarrass you. Do to them. It's active. Do to them what you would like them to do to you. No teacher ever taught like this man. When he finished that great sermon in Matthew 7, 28, 29, it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, how did the scribes teach? That statement is not a criticism of the teaching of the scribes. The scribes taught exactly like I'm doing right now except they had the Old Testament. They gave Old Testament verses, and they would say certain 
uh, commentators that have studied this verse uh, gave this explanation and this explanation, and I, I will try to make an application of it. So now, how did Jesus differ from that? What does it mean he taught them as one having authority? Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, he would quote from the law of Moses, and then what did he say? And I say to you, just like Moses was the authority under the law of Moses, Jesus is saying, I personally am the authority on this matter. To give you a simple comparison, imagine if I quoted Jesus tonight, and then I said, but I say to you, well, you drive me out of here on a rail, and you should. Because that makes me the authority. But Jesus was not afraid to say, but I say to you, and the people were astonished because his teaching was true and accurate. And yet he claims to be the origin of the authority of his teaching. And he was. <clears throat> Let's look at the greatest summary of our duty to God and man. It's another very familiar passage. Matthew 22, 34 to 40. And let's see the moral glory of Jesus in this teaching. That we lo should love God and we should love our fellow man. All right, Matthew 22, 34. Pharisees and the Sadducees have been trying to trick them and trap him, and they sent a lawyer to him. <coughs> Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, why is that a trick question? Because any law or passage he can give, they can switch to another one and say, well, what about this one? You overlooked that one. Why didn't you mention this one? It's a trap. How could you escape a trap like that? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Love God with every fiber of your being. Now stop and think. If you're the lawyer trying to trick him and trap him, how would you answer that? How would you answer that? Then he said, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And don't miss the next verse. On these two commandments hang, what's the next word? A-L-L. -L. All the law and the commandments. So ultimately he did not try to pick out one commandment. That's not what he's doing. He said, you need to embrace all the commandments of God. And it all stands on the foundation of loving God and loving each other. Wow. That guy hung his head and didn't ask any more questions. And this statement of Jesus shows his moral glory. If only Ron Halber could learn the full measure to love God with all my heart and soul and mind and to treat every person I come into contact with as I would want to be true. There's the moral glory of Jesus. And then it's interesting. When the Jewish authorities sent officers to arrest him, they were arrested by the clarity and the truth of what he taught. This is in John 7. You will remember the occasion. The Jewish authorities sent soldiers to arrest Jesus. They knew where he was. No problem to find him. And that's in John 7, 32. Now if you drop down to verse 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees. And they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? You're empty-handed. Well, where's the criminal we sent you to get? Officers answered, never a man spank like this man. Now look, to get the impact, try to think there's some mass murderer, some dangerous criminal in this area that's been on the news. 
And the chief of police found out where they are. He got a tip. And he sent officers to arrest this horrible person. Now try to see the clip on the evening news. They show the officers coming to the chief of the police who says, where is the criminal? And they're just starstruck. They said, he was teaching. Sir, we never heard a man teach like that. Can you see the look on the chief of police face? Can you understand the impact Jesus had on the soldiers that went with the full intention to arrest him? What he taught was so clear, so simple, so profound, so true. They just felt paralyzed. They could not harm this man. Never has a man lived like this. And never has a man taught like this. This is the moral glory of Jesus Christ. And then he sought no earthly gain, no earthly glory. His one purpose of being here was to fulfill God's plan for our salvation. And in this you see his moral glory. In John 6, when he fed the thousands with a few loaves and fishes, Verse 15, the Bible said, When Jesus therefore perceived they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. They were going to hoist him on their shoulders and pronounce him the king. He will not accept that kind of glory. He did not come for that kind of kingdom. This is the moral glory of Jesus. Remember when he was examined by Pilate, John 18, 36, and the Jewish authorities trying to find an excuse that the Roman authorities would accept to crucify Jesus, accused him that he was trying to stir up a rebellion and make himself a king. So Herod needed to ask that question. Are you a king? And you know, you know the answer. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate, I have a kingdom, but it is wholly unlike your kingdom. Yours is political and military. Mine is a kingdom of truth, a spiritual kingdom. He knew how to equip and train his disciples to fight. He said so right here. <coughs> he did not come for that purpose. In John 14, 10, here's why he came. Short summary of why he came. He said to them on that occasion, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? So what's he saying there? Everything he did, he did in unity with the Father in heaven. Everything. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. I do it with the Father. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So the miracles that I do, they come from the Father. The words that I teach, they come from the Father. Why are you here, Jesus? To fulfill my Father's will. That's why he was here. Every step, every word. He sought no earthly gain or glory. Now here's a powerful passage that will shine more light on his moral glory. Matthew 20. Remember when the mother of James and John asked that Jesus elevate her sons in the coming kingdom? In John 20, 25 to 28. Now after she made that request, the disciples got into a dispute over this. And this is how Jesus settled it. Jesus called unto them and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. And pause a minute. <clears throat> the reason he said that, he said, that's the same mistake you're making in this argument. You're fighting each other to find out who will get a place of power. Now, he's going to correct that. 
It shall not be so among you. Whosoever be great among you, let him be your minister. And he used a special Greek word that means like a household servant. Have you ever hired somebody to clean your house? Or more commonly, to mow your yard? And Jesus said, you learn to be a servant like that. Then he went deeper. And whosoever will be chief among you, that can be your servant, he switches to a Greek word that means a slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And let me show you the moral glory of Jesus here. Ron Halbrook, when you're thinking about arguing with some of your brethren to see if you can't get ahead of them, learn to think that in reality you are the household servant of that man. No, you are the slave of that man. And you need to act like it. Is anybody feeling the force of that? I am. I am. There's not any place for us to grab at straws and see who can get ahead of each other in this kingdom of God. The question is, which one of us can serve the most? Which one of us can humble himself down to the lowest level of a slave to my brethren. That should be the focus of the life of Ron Calvary. What can I do to serve these brethren? That's the kingdom they brought. There is the moral glory of Christ. He sought no earthly gain or exaltation, and he's teaching me not to seek it. And that's the moral glory. Talk very unpopular truth. That adds weight to his moral glory. And here's one that we don't get the impact of it because our culture is different. Let's read it just here for a moment. John 10, 15 to 16. This was not popular when he said this. John 10, 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And here comes the cutting part. He's talking to the Jewish audience. He says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. They're not Jews like you. Them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. We have some experience of what he's saying. There are groups of people, different nationalities and races, that sometimes have animosity. But turning time back, think about this. The Jews for centuries had thought of the Gentiles as dogs. Would you call another human being a dog? They called those Gentiles dogs. And the Gentiles for centuries had viewed the Jews as barbarians with no intelligence, idiotic people. And Jesus said, I'm going to bring the dogs and the barbarians into one family. Now that would not have been popular to either the Jews or the Gentiles. But he meant every word of that, and he did it. And he did it. And he's doing it until this day. It wasn't popular when he taught that. And then, and then, in John 6, 15, when he refused to be their king, John 18, 36, when he said, I did not come for a political kingdom, this teaching was not popular. They wanted him to be a political king. If he had agreed to do that, they would have followed him by the thousands. They wanted the king to overthrow the Roman power and make the Jews a world power. So when he said, I only have a spiritual kingdom, it was very unpopular. Now we've already read Matthew 20, 25 to 28. He denounced self-ambition, self-elevation, self-righteousness. 
learn to be a servant, learn to be a slave, and then he died for our sins because he walked in those shoes himself. And he teaches us to serve. Was that popular? No, that wasn't popular. All right? Something else, last of all. The man who saw his moral glory <coughs> risked everything, including their lives, to follow him. Acts chapter 5, remember when the apostles were arrested the second time? In Acts chapter 5 and verse 33, because the apostles explained, we will not stop preaching the gospel of Christ. He is the true Savior. Verse 33, when they, the authorities, heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. So they began making a plan to murder him, uh, to murder them like they had done to Jesus. We don't have time to read it, but one of their leaders named Gamaliel said, wait, time out, stop. We made that mistake once. And if this movement is not from God, it will fail anyway. So we're not going to kill somebody here today. So verse 40, to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now I need to pause and explain what beating means. It's not like a spanking. They stripped their clothes, they tied their hands and made them bend over and stretch their back and they came down on them with instruments that after several lashes will break the flesh open. Now what would I do if I was beaten like that? Would I show up for the Church of Christ tomorrow? Well, here's what they did, verse 40. They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They were not ashamed that Christ had been crucified as a common criminal. And they were not ashamed when they were threatened themselves with their very lives. Why were they so focused on obeying Christ? They saw what I must see so that I can serve Him. They saw His moral glory. They saw His moral glory. Christ is the sinless Savior, the perfect high priest. Holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And He offered one perfect sacrifice to give us the hope of heaven. His influence reflects His perfections. Jesus of Nazareth without money and arms conquered more millions than Alexander, Caesar, Mohammed, and Napoleon. And he did it without science and learning, without the eloquence of a great speaker, without writing a single line. There never was in this world a life so unpretending, so modest, and lowly in its outward form and condition and yet producing such extraordinary effects upon all ages, nations, and classes of men. And brethren, I say again, we can identify with that influence because it's in our hearts. That's why we're here tonight. And so tonight, the moral glory of Jesus is still shining. Like a lighthouse on the shore, like a beacon light, his moral perfection is seen in the face of temptation. It is seen as he was meticulously examined by friend and enemy. And it is seen in the teaching that Jesus did. That beacon light, his moral glory is shining tonight in such a way that he calls <coughs> sinners to receive salvation. Are you lost in the darkness of sin tonight? Our sins stand in stark contrast to His moral glory. His moral glory makes me ashamed of my sins, and I need that. But I also should know He died as the perfect sacrifice to wash away all of those sins. I am ashamed of those things. 
But I also have the understanding God has forgiven those things. That door of mercy is open tonight. If you need to obey the gospel, tonight you can be cleansed of your sins. Will you submit to Christ by faith in Him? Will you do as Peter said in Acts 2.38, repent of those sins? Will you submit to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The door of God's mercy is open for that tonight. We're singing a song as a means to invite you to come and submit your soul and your sins to Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian but you've stumbled and fallen back, this is the right time at the right place. Come home. Come home to the sinless Savior that loves you and died for you. Will you come tonight while we stand together and sing this song?